Good morning. I'm Reverend Todd Weir, and our service is about to begin. I invite you to relax and listen to this morning's prelude. Welcome to the Congregational Church here in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. It is Sunday. It's the Sabbath, a day that is set aside for rest and renewal. We need these rhythms of work and play and rest to be whole. And you could be doing a lot of things this morning, but you're in church right here together. And we're here because we need a place to express our gratitude and our hopes. We need a place where we can lay down our burdens before God and find new strength and courage. That's what Sabbath is for. I bet we're all carrying some kind of burden here this morning. 
Some of those burdens may be from our wider society when we see human suffering in the face of, um, I think we've got everything going on, floods, fires, earthquakes, climate change. We hear the news of war that creates death, refugees, high gas prices. We may feel a sense of despair if there's if we see racism and homophobia in our society. So our theme today in worship is do justice. Live to make the world better, to serve one another in community. May this Sabbath morning ease our burdens as we share them together and invite God into our lives to make us whole. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, no matter whom you love, you are welcome here, whether you're a believer, a questioner, or a questioning believer, welcome. Let's begin our worship as we join together for our prayer of invocation. Today's scripture addresses the topic of justice as a subject closely akin to mercy, a subject whose quality, in the Bard's words, is not strained. Indeed, William Shakespeare eloquently addressed the subject of mercy in his play The Merchant of Venice. I've just finished reading Maggie O'Farrell's very poignant and acclaimed novel about Shakespeare's son, Hamnet. And I am quite interested and familiar with Shakespeare. As many of you may recall, Shakespeare in the just mentioned play, Merchant of Venice, spoke of mercy as the twice blessed gentle rain that droppeth from heaven, that blessed him that gives and him that takes. And isn't that equally true about the subject of today's scripture, justice? Let us now pray. Dear God, Micah in today's scripture commands us to do justice, love kindness, and in truth, to be merciful. Dear Lord, give us the strength and the wisdom to make us not only a more just, but also a more faithfully merciful people. Amen.
we come together to lay down our burdens, I invite you to join together in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Forgiving God, in a world filled with so much pain, we confess we often shut our eyes to keep from seeing things as they truly are. Grant us the strength to face the reality of our world and give us the courage to bring your light to those who walk in darkness. Open our eyes to our own misunderstandings, our own failures, our own faults. God, lead us in the footsteps of Jesus, who reveals your light through his life, his teachings, and his love. Amen. In a moment of silence, may we each lift up our prayers to God. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. God sent Jesus into the world, not to judge us, but to save us and heal us. God accepts both our courage as well as our fears and tells us the hopeful message that our sins are forgiven. Friends, dare to accept that gift of a new beginning. And listen, give thanks, and live. Amen. I invite you to rise, pass the peace to one another. You may bow or shake hands or whatever you would like. Let's first face our um, online audience and we welcome you. We send the peace of Christ to you, to one another. We, we welcome Tim Whistler on the organ as our guest organist today. Welcome. Peace be with all of you. I invite you to find your seats again. Um, just a quick reminder to sign the uh, friendship pads that are in the pews. Um, it's a good way to keep in touch with us if you'd like us to have your email and get our Wednesday emails. It also helps us if we ever needed to, um, in, in case of uh, COVID, if we needed to um, let you know that something happened, we'd have your contact information. All right, let's hear this morning's scripture lesson. All right, the first scripture reading comes from Luke, chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the second reading from Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. What God requires. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? with ten thousands of rivers of oil? 
Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Friends, pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Do justice. It's an active, imperative phrase. Do justice. It doesn't just say, pray for justice or hope for justice. It doesn't say, get as many catchy Facebook memes of all the things that disturb you out there as possible or voice your opinions often, whether people like it or not, or vote for the correct political party, but do justice. Actively work so that goodness may prevail in the world. So this is the third sermon in a three-parter. We started a few weeks ago with walk humbly with your God, humility and the word human come from humus, soil, earth. We're, we're called to be grounded. Humility is, is um, it's grounded, it's from the earth, it's being self-aware and curious rather than rigid and walking with God. Then a couple weeks ago, I preached on loving kindness, that we act for the good of another person without any expectation of reward or return to us. Kindness is that habit where we do things for other people just because they are God's creation and they need our love. And you might wish that we'd stop there. Kindness. Humility, those are, are wonderful things, but we start getting into justice and what happens? Controversy. It might even get a little political, right? And that's when all kindness and humility start to disappear. You see why I started with humility and kindness, not with justice. <laughs> but, but the challenge of this text is to hold these three things together, that they're interrelated, that we don't just do one or the other, but we're just as we're being kind, we're humble as we're being just, that, that we have to hold this together somehow. That's what Micah is telling us. So let's focus in on what Micah might have meant by justice and, and how that might shape our ethical and moral vision as a congregation. Let me start with, what do you think of when I say the word justice? What comes to mind? Laws. Laws, right. What else? Fairness. Fairness. Equality. Equality. Say it again. Equity. Equity. Anything else? Love. Love. You're hitting all the highlights. <laughs> so, justice can mean the administration of law, like Don said. The Department of Justice oversees the, the legal system. If you're a member of the Supreme Court, you are called a justice, right? When a criminal who's guilty is indicted and, and goes to jail, we might think justice has been done. So it can be legal. Somebody mentioned fairness. You've probably seen that symbol for justice. It's the Roman goddess Justicia with the uh, blindfold. It's right up on your screen and holding the balance. Blindfolded because justice should not look at who they're judging, their, their wealth or their power or their prominence, but rather they're blind to that and, and holding the balance of evidence. Justice comes from the weighing of evidence and, and fairness, not 
who you know or how much power you have. No one is above the law. But justice is more than good laws. We can have an excellent legal system and people can still be hungry or lack medical care. So another form of justice is distributive justice. That we order society in such a way that everyone has the basics that they need, food, health care, safety, a place to live. It doesn't mean everybody has exactly the same, but there's a, there's a minimum standard of what society should hold for community. We see this in the scripture we read uh, from Luke where Jesus says, I've come to preach good news to the poor. He didn't just say good news for everybody, but, but especially good news for the poor, release for the captive, the, the year of the Lord's favor, which was a once in a generation release of debts. So, so if that's what Jesus preached, do you think he would care about health care policy or tax policy or the minimum wage? Things that might help a society have distributive justice. And, and a fourth form of justice that I just want to mention, we don't talk about it much, it's restorative justice. This is the practice where we try to mend and heal the wounds of injustice. For example, Mennonites have been on the forefront of encouraging mediation and reconciliation, maybe between somebody who perpetrated a crime and their victim, that they will bring people together and there's a form of restitution, of understanding, maybe even forgiveness and reconciliation that help people move forward. Um, for example, when I came to my church in Northampton, the church administrator was on trial for 50 counts of embezzlement. It happens, right? And so the church had found the evidence and given it over to the police, but people didn't feel like it was justice to just have her go to prison. She had a family. And, and what good would it do to be away from her family for 10 years in prison? And so many people wrote to the judge and said, we urge leniency. And so the judge made a plea deal with um, our church administrator and she agreed to do restitution. Um, and as long as she fulfilled that, she wouldn't go to prison. And at the end of the legal hearing, the judge said, and now I want you to turn around and face the church that you stole from and apologize to them. And it was very powerful. It was, it was restorative justice rather than punitive justice. So justice can be legal, it can be fair, it can distribute things or it can be um, restorative. So let's take a look at, and you know how much I love word studies, right? So we're gonna look at Micah. And what did he mean when he used the word justice? In Hebrew, it was mishpat, mishpat. The word occurs over 400 times in the Old Testament. So it, that's pretty important. One of the most important words in the Hebrew scriptures, mishpat. The most common translation was the legal ordinances that people were called to follow. The Ten Commandments are mishpat. You know, don't steal, don't lie, don't kill, mishpat. The word could also refer to a person's character. If you were a righteous person, a good person, you were said to have mishpat. God is mishpat. Often the word can also be used when it's used by prophets. It means a just ordered society. The, the Micah and Isaiah and 
Amos and Hosea and all the prophets, they often were saying to the king and the leaders of community and the wealthy that society needs to be more just, more fair, provide more for the people at the bottom. So mishpat could mean a well-ordered society. And as I was doing my word studies, I was really surprised at what book of the Bible uses this word the most. And, and do you want to have any guesses about what part of the Bible you think would have the most references to justice? A little louder. <coughs> Romans, good guess. Some might say the, the legal books of the, you know, Deuteronomy and so on. Here's the shocker. It's the Psalms. The hymnal. I mean, imagine that. More references to justice in the hymnal than in the prophets. So it's saying mishpat is central to how we worship. We're supposed to sing it and live it. Old Testament professor Walter Brueggemann says that when God looks at a nation and judges how is this nation doing, God's not looking at the gross national product or the size of its armies but the, or, or how huge the public buildings are. God is looking at how the most vulnerable people in society are treated. That's the essence of mishpat as it as it says in the Psalms, Psalm 82, give justice to the weak and orphan, maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Well, the, the orphan and the widow were considered the most vulnerable people and how does a society treat them? That's how God measures how we're doing. So that's what Micah's talking about. Mishpat. And Let's look at four different ways that we as a congregation or we in our lives might live out this kind of justice. I'd say they are character, generosity, beloved community, and action to order society for the common good. So I'm, I'm going to talk about character first because I think it's important if we act in ways that are honest, if we are filled with integrity and fairness and inclusiveness in the ways we relate to people out in the world, well then I think we are bending the arc towards justice at least a little bit. You know, we can't have a just society if we ourselves are not willing to deal fairly with one another. Leviticus 25 says, you know, even when you sell something to your neighbor, don't cheat them. Be careful in those yard sales. <laughs> it's justice. It's character. And not only for ourselves, but we should ask of our, our elected officials and our leaders to have character. Somehow we've gotten to this place that we think the ends justify the means. We vote for people who we think are going to do what we want, but if they don't have character, it's not going to turn out well. Second, generosity is a form of justice. Scripture is full of examples of give alms to help the poor. Whenever you give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, you have done it to him. If someone is cold and they don't have a coat, give them your coat so that they may be warm. It's central to the gospel. That's why we give 12% of our pledges to causes that alleviate suffering and injustice. It's why we raised money for Ukrainian refugees when the war started. We saw that as, that is mishpah. When we look to the winter, we know that fuel prices have skyrocketed and it's going to be very difficult for people to make ends meet this winter. So we will probably have a big fundraiser in December to try to um, fill the coffers of the fuel fund. And we're going to hear more about CRC at our mission moment this morning from Holly. Generosity 
is a form of justice. So a third form of justice, you might not think of this one, but Dr. King talked about being beloved community. That, that justice is also living together as a church in such a way that we try to model how we treat each other. If, if we live in respect and love and kindness and we, we forgive each other and support each other in our burdens, we're, we're living as beloved community. We're, we're welcoming people beyond ourselves, not just people like us, but people who are often marginalized in our society. So beloved community, we'd show hospitality to people of all races, people who identify as LGBTQ, workers from away, welcoming the stranger. Justice is done when we live together in a way that says this is how God intends for all of us to live. We have to do it here first or we're not gonna do a very good job when we go out to society. So probably on those three forms of justice, we're in widespread agreement, right? We, you all wanna have character, yes? You, you all wanna be, you are very generous people. And the idea of living together as beloved community, that all appeals to us. But then we come to this hard part. What do we do in society about the laws and the, the policies surrounding justice for the common good? Often this is where we get into the place of deep disagreement and conflict. Some think pastors shouldn't enter into politics at all. In fact, someone was telling me they were playing cards the other day with a group and, and one of the people that was with them said, well, I hear that Congregationalist minister preaches politics. And, and I always wonder what that means. Does it mean their politics are different than mine so I don't like them? Does it mean we should never ever talk about political issues in church? And let's just do a, a thought experiment. Let's imagine that a preacher never talked about political issues ever. Not, I'm not going to talk about climate change, race relations, poverty, LGBTQ issues. If it's controversial and political, we're not going to talk about it. So if we did that, who then is going to form our ethical and moral consciousness? If we're not exploring scripture and theology and our tradition and talking about these things, in church, where are they talked about? It means basically we're gonna say that our society is gonna be formed by MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News. Is that the world you want? Or would you rather hear sometimes some thoughts on the gospel and our political issues? And maybe I give some opinions and maybe you like them and maybe you don't, but, but the point is we're trying to be formed towards what God intense. And I think most clergy, at least in the UCC, would consider it a dereliction of duty to never talk about these things. So here's another reason that I think sometimes we need to address this. So we're out here, we're doing all these things to be good people. We're raising money for the fuel fund and we're trying to live with character and trying to be good to each other in community. We're doing all that. But then injustice in society can just wipe it out in a moment. For example, you know, we're out visiting everybody who's sick and we've got our prayer list and we're praying for them and we're delivering casseroles and maybe even helping pay for their medical prescriptions. We're doing all of that, but if there is not health care for everyone, what's going to happen? We're going to be totally swamped. We don't have enough generosity um, unless we're going to start, you know, praying, you know, really, really healing people, right? How, how are people going to get healed if there's not enough medical care?
Or we're out there raising money for the fuel fund, which is an excellent, important thing to do. It's right here in our community. We know how vital it is. But if we're not paying attention to what causes poverty, the needs again are gonna overwhelm us. That we need to have conversations about how is there a baseline so that people have enough to live upon. Or we're, we're trying to live as a LGBTQ affirming congregation and be, be welcoming of all people in our church. We can do that well, but what if marriage equality is ended because we didn't speak up? And then there's a lot of pain and suffering in our families because of that. This is why we sometimes have to take on these issues, even if they're hard. Even if we start from a place where we might not even agree with each other. But as, you know, Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador once said, when I fed the hungry, they called me a saint. When I asked why they were hungry, they called me a communist. <laughs> Society doesn't necessarily want us getting in there with our religion. And yet I don't think Jesus created and called us together as church to never make any waves. Sometimes we have to step in and stand up for what is right. And I think when Micah said, do justice, he meant that in the fullest sense possible. He meant act with character, create good communities where people are included and cared for, be generous, and pay attention to how society is ordered so that there is justice. But it's so important we remember all of what Micah said. While we're doing justice, be kind, be humble. We can't dismiss that from doing justice as well. And, and I think that's why we are different than just being social activists. We're not just trying to win for our cause. We're not supposed to be one of the political parties at prayer, Democrat or Republican. I think we have something important that's distinct and different from that kind of politics. How we act is just as important as where it is that we stand. So in those times that we need to talk about some of these issues, we should try to not be intentionally inflammatory or make personal attacks or the overheated hyperbole. Imagine how much better things would be if we could just do that, to, to talk about issues, to be weighing justice like the Roman goddess rather than turning it into these kinds of attacks and complete struggles of good versus evil. And to be humble while we do that. No public policy will bring us perfect justice. It always solves one set of problems and creates some others. But we do our best. No political party is the right hand of God. And sometimes we have to remember that we've got the log in our own eye that needs to be removed so that we can see more clearly how we might be participating in injustice. So that's how we, we try to live with kindness and humility while we're also doing justice together. So I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of what Micah has to tell us. And, and what I hope is it's, it's starting a conversation about how we try to do these things together as a congregation. How can we be at work in the world and be engaged in our mission? And I think Micah gives us this great, almost mission statement, justice, kindness, humility. May it be so among us. Amen.
Please be seated. As we come to our time of prayer, I wonder if there are joys or concerns that any of you would like to share this morning. Yes. Uh, we're very happy to uh, welcome my granddaughter who came to New York, Maine, uh, to church with us this morning. She's here for three weeks with us this summer. Great. Welcome. I think a lot of people have uh, family members who are here and uh, um, some visitors from out of town. It's great to have you all. Yes. Yes. We're blessed with my niece, uh, Margaret, and her daughter, Jessica, for the week. Great. And you jumped into choir. Thank you. That's great. Other joys? In the, yes, Liam. I just wanted to say, to um, go off your very amazing sermon, I just, I, just, I, just, I couldn't help but write some thoughts down, that what I've noticed is a lot of what's happened now is that we've let ourselves be blind to what's going on purposely. We don't want to acknowledge the fact that mm. There's so much horribleness going on right now in the world. We, our brains just mentally can't handle it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's what your sermon was very good at forcefully telling us, because some God knows when we need to be forcefully told, that we can't let the fog of fear and insecurity blind us to what is right in front of us. And we have to be able to rumble in the vulnerability of the unknown, of we don't know, we don't want to approach it because the only way that we can actually do all the forms of justice and what in the ways that we can is to wholeheartedly accept we may not know what to do but when we work together as a collective whole we can make good great change and i think that is something that we desperately need to preach to everyone mm -hmm. thank you liam and and are you available to preach next sunday <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if, if you couldn't hear, Leo was talking about how hard it is because we, we get overwhelmed and we purposely just don't see things sometimes because it's hard. And, and I think actually next week I'm going to be preaching about hope because if, if we don't have hope, why try? Um, and so how do, we, how do we be filled with hope so that we, we can do these things? So that's kind of the follow-up. Other joys and concerns. Yes, Laura. Um, I concerned her about the video, and that was still on staff for a few years. You know, his family and you know, his friends, and you know, the reason that has been slowed down. Yeah. We had a, a fatal accident on Southport, which is just really sad. Thank you. We pray for that. Um, I'm going to add a joy. Um, both Justin and Gene Smith have been in the hospital and rehab for many, many weeks. They are both now home, um, which is great. So good to see you at home. I know they're watching. Um, I will also add, I saw Jameson's grandmother, Laura. We've been praying very hard for Jameson. He's had a very rough week uh, in the hospital last two weeks, really. And she said he's doing better and uh, eating a bit and standing. And so we're hopeful as we continue our prayers for Jameson. Friends, let us pray. God, we pray that your love, your hope and justice flows like a river that never runs dry. Please help us with all that we have to be honest and fair like you are. May we be people of abundance, pouring out what we have being mindful and generous towards those who are poor. May justice and peace rule and fairness flow like a river that never runs dry. May we be your people and defend those who need our advocacy. Rescue those who are without homes. May we be as helpful as the rain that refreshes the ground to those who are treated unjustly. Let wholeness and fairness be present just as we pray each Sunday, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. O God of justice and fairness, flow like a river that never runs dry. Because you are our God, be with all those who are hurting. 
we we lift up our prayers in the midst of all of the from, from floods to intense heat and and fires we pray for those who are in harm's way and whose lives have been upended we pray for the planet we pray for our own connections to this earth and inspire us to be just and kind to all living creatures and the planet that holds us as our home. We lift up our prayers for all who are grieving. We especially think of the family where people were killed in an automobile accident in our community. We pray for safety and surround us with love when we are in these times of deep loss. We pray for those in need of health and healing. We especially continue our prayers for Becky Welsh as she recovers. We pray for Jameson, for his well-being and wholeness. We pray for Ann Hurt, Jean's mom, in her physical health challenges. Of oh God, walk with us this day and this week. Let peace be within us and let us share it. Let your justice and fairness be in our hearts and may they also reach from sea to sea across the earth. God, flow like a river of justice and fairness that never dries. May we never be thirsty. May we never be weary of sharing a cup of cold water. We lift up all of these prayers and pray as Jesus taught all of his disciples, our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to our time of offering, we have a mission moment this morning. I'd like to welcome Holly Stover, who's not only a member of the church, but also works for the Community Resource Council, which is one of the organizations that we support through our mission dollars. And I'm gonna turn it over to Holly. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, everyone. The Community Resource Council is your agency here in the Booth Bay region. Um, Actually, the foundation of the Community Resource Council exists right here in this church. For those of you who don't remember, um, in the earliest days before there ever was the BRCRC or the CRC as we are now called, our home was here. Um, and Sarah Folger, Bruce Johnson, Ted Ripa, and Barkley Shepherd. Where are you? Hi, Barkley. <laughs> Barkley, who's, who uh, were among some of the original founding members of this fabulous organization. It came, really was born out of um, a reason to have an agency here that could care for local people. And that's what we've done um, for the past 10 years. We were incorporated in 2011. We really began in 2004 when a group of clergy members brought together by Sarah Folger got together and said people would go to the town and to a church and to the town and to another church to figure out how to pay their monthly bills. And what didn't change is whatever was underneath. Um, that kept them from being able to be self-sufficient or more sufficient. Um, and that's not a criticism, it's a reality. Um, and so they got together and they said, what could we do? Well, we could pool our money. We put our money together. So instead of coming to several places, you come to one place, then what else could happen? And it was actually Wendy Wolf who sent Sarah Folger um, a grant opportunity um, back in 2010, I believe. And we, uh, Sarah and I, in the office over there, 
many nights crafted out the first grant that we were able to um, put together and hire a community navigator. So we took all those things of having people going from church to church to town office to town office, and we had somebody who could actually sit down with people and say, so what's going on? And we do that even today, the community navigator um, is really the portal program for many of our programs. Hannah Corkum is the community navigator, and she sits with people and not just talks about, so you need money for your rent or you need some money for food, but what's going on? What's the big picture? And we think about justice. There's no justice in being poor. Being poor, you sometimes are born into poverty, and sometimes if you're born into intergenerational poverty, it's very hard to get out of poverty. And I think about all of the wonderful people who do jobs. Some of us can't imagine they do jobs. They work all night at Irving, or they work at Hannaford overnight, or they work in other places where they make barely above a minimum wage. And when they come home at the end of the week, they might have $420, $450. And if you add that up over the course of the month, they have about $2,000 in that household to make it work. I would encourage you, any of, you, any of us, to try to make it work on less than $2,000 a month when you have to pay rent and your car and your insurance and your food and clothing for your kids. And it's very difficult. So we see people who work really hard. I think that's one of the myths I always like to talk about. We see people who work really hard who still struggle to make ends meet, and we're there for them. We also help people stay in their housing. Unhousing or becoming homeless becomes incredibly, not only difficult, but expensive. So if we can <clears throat> use some of our resources to keep someone housed, not only is their life more stable, but it's much cheaper than unhousing them and trying to, to find another place. And that includes sometimes a mortgage payment. That includes sometimes some property taxes. But it keeps people housed and in our community, which is really important. The other things that we do, um, I always say we have two direct care programs, the Community Navigator and the Addiction Outreach Program, which I work in. The Addiction Outreach Program um, has been working for almost six years. Can you believe it? Six years. I'm looking at Peggy because she was part of that initial founding. Um, and we've served almost 300 people. 300 people in this community who have struggled with addiction in various ways and we're able to work, we work with the Booth Bay Harbor Police Department to do referrals, provide information, meet with families, meet with individuals and help people access treatment and sometimes that means taking them. And I can tell you there have been nights, 7 o'clock at night, I've gone with our police chief Bob Hash and we've driven people to get to a treatment center because that's what it means, that's what it takes, that's what it means. Um, we're very fortunate to have that program here. Uh, we're very fortunate to have all of these programs here. The other programs that we have, so we have two direct care programs. We have two heating programs. The two heating programs are first the woodchucks, and who doesn't love the woodchucks? The woodchucks are a group, including Barkley. Um, the woodchucks have a wood pile up by the, the dump, the refuse station, um, and that's given to us by the town of Booth Bay, that space, and they harvest, split, stack, season, and deliver hardwood. And this past winter, 2021, we um, delivered, they delivered um, 55 cords of wood. 55 cords of wood, I can't even imagine that would, what that would fill. Um, but 55 cords of wood for people who burn primarily with wood and would have been otherwise cold. So thank you to the woodchucks who meet cold, hot, season after season, every Tuesday and Saturday morning, that's a plug. If you or someone, um, that you know wants to volunteer, they're always looking for people who want to work on that wood pile, and it's, it's a mighty, they're a formidable, formidable group. Um, I love going up there, the energy is amazing. We also have the Community Fuel Fund, which Todd talked about. We're deeply concerned about the fuel fund. The price of fuel oil right now is very high, and we have people who are going to have to turn to us. And I just want to say thank you to this congregation. You have always stepped up not just for the fuel fund, but the fuel fund and all of our other programs. We have two eating programs after heating. We have Food for Thought, and Food for Thought, we deliver nutritiously dense, high protein foods um, to families on Fridays to carry them through the weekend for the children. The children are identified by the school as being risk of low nutrition. So we have volunteers. Michael Maxim is the coordinator of the Food for Thought program, and he puts it all together, and the volunteers deliver fixed root um, every Friday even in the summer, um, so that we make sure that there's extra food going to the household for the weekend. We also are starting the community fridge. I'm going to 
step out and leave that to last. Our other two programs include Booth Bay Rides. If you were ever looking for a volunteer opportunity, we're always looking for somebody who might be willing to give someone a ride who can't drive or doesn't drive to a medical or non-medical appointment. Non-medical is really important. If you want to go to an attorney, if you want to go to out of town and do a shopping trip, or you need to get to a medical appointment, and sometimes that's Brunswick or further. Um, we have Booth Bay Rides. We also do grocery delivery as part of Booth Bay Rides for people who are shut in, or since COVID, they just don't want to go to Hannaford yet. Um, so Booth Bay Rides is always a volunteer opportunity. Um, it takes a little bit of time each week and you can help a neighbor in need. Set for Success um, is coming up August 31st, and that's our opportunity, to, I call it, to level the playing field. We provide every school-aged child in this region what they need to start school. We have teacher lists. You all have seen the teacher lists if you have children, and we shop for that. We raise the money for that. Again, thank you to the congregation. We shop for everything that the children need. They get an L.L. Bean backpack, and that way every child in that classroom has the same thing the day they start school. And that's really important when we think about shame and stigma, when we talk about justice, when we talk about kindness. It's really important that all of our children, all of our children walk into the classroom feeling the same. The last is the Community Fridge. It's our newest program. I'm very excited. Um, we are working with the town of Booth Bay. Um, one of the thing about the Community Resource Council is we didn't have hundreds of, we have three full-time staff, but we have hundreds of volunteers hundreds, many, I'm looking at many of you. And the Community Fridge is a project with the Town of Booth Bay, which is a new partnership, not really a new partnership because they help to give us funding every year, but a new way to partner with the town. And if you notice, there's a beautiful new shed sitting on the lawn of the town office. It matches the building. It's waiting for its shingled roof. I've ordered the flooring. Uh, we have a refrigerator, freezer, shelving, and a cupboard that will go in there. And the community fridge is going to be our project, your project. And what will be in there is food in the refrigerator. We think of staples, milk, butter, cheese, eggs, to me. They might be meals, they might be sandwiches, or yogurts, or gogurts. And in the freezer, we'll have frozen soup, frozen you know, lasagna, or casseroles, and some bread. And in the cupboards, maybe cereal, macaroni and cheese. But what it will be, if you think about shame and stigma, it will be a place 24-7 a person can go and pick out what they need for themselves or for their family. No shame, no stigma, very anonymous, very quietly. There's going to be two access points along the sidewalk between the town office and the um, town the town office and the post office. So you can pull in either way. And we're structuring, there will be a ramp on there so that if you have a wheelchair or even a walker, it'll be navigable for you. Uh, but it's gonna be easy access, easy in, easy out, and you can do it at a time of day that really works for you. So it is, is essentially going to be a 24 seven pantry, um, something for everybody. And what we want people to really understand what we hope to put inside is a sign that says, take what you need, leave what you can. And that's gonna be for all of us. Take what, leave what, <laughs> take what you need, leave what you can is for all of us. So thank you. Um, I look forward to that opening. We'll be having sort of a little announcement. We're waiting for the electricity, the roof, the floor, and then we'll be ready to go. But we're very excited about this new project. The reason we're able to do what we do in this community, we're a hybrid is because of all of you. This organization wouldn't exist without donors and without volunteers. We don't take state or federal money. I'm kind of proud of that, says someone who worked in state government, because we're able to do what we need based on what our community wants. And we're able to do that because you support us. So when you think about the message this morning about justice, and you think about kindness, and you think about love and humility, you do this for your neighbors in need. Nobody ever wanted to be that person. I've said before that I think about the way we all started school and I can remember sitting in kindergarten, we folded our hands and they were on our desk and nobody said, I hope I end up being that person who has to figure out how to feed my family. That person who has to figure out where I'm gonna sleep tonight. But we're so fortunate that we live in a community that lifts up. We don't give hands out, we don't give handouts, we give legs up. Um, and we try 
a rising tide floats all boats, and it certainly is true for the Community Resource Council and for the people of the Booth Bay region who rely on us to show up every day and be there for when they need or if they want. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Holly. And all that with three staff people. That's great. Friends, freely we have received from God. May we freely give in the morning offering. let us pray and bless these offerings. Gracious God, we offer these things up in the hopes that justice and kindness and hope may be spread throughout the world. We pray for the Community Resource Council and all of their work, and may your generosity to us be reflected in our generosity to the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
please be seated. Um, I think we sent Seth the wrong words to that hymn, so apologies. Um, as our service comes to an end, just a few announcements. I hope you'll join us for coffee hour downstairs right after service. The elevator isn't fixed yet. We had somebody get stuck last week. There's like two people in Maine that can fix this elevator. So we're hoping to get it done this week so that we can use it again. Um, the newsletter will be coming out this week so you can see what's happening. Um, one thing we've been working on behind the scenes, and this is gonna sound very boring, but it's really exciting actually. We're getting a new comprehensive database and, and what that's gonna allow us to do is have an online directory, have an app on your phone where you can contact everyone in the church. It'll help us with communications. It also is helping us with online giving. You'll notice at the, on the front page of your, call, your, of your worship order this morning, you can now scan the QR code or you can text to give as well as go through our website. So these are just things that we're doing to come into the 21st century and, and do our best. And um, Heather's been working very hard to get this ready and you can start to use it as soon as you get the newsletter and start seeing how it's gonna work. Um, I think that's all of our announcements. Let me send you off with a blessing. Friends, you are a blessing. Continue to send your blessings forth. Pray often, practice peace, lead with love, be joyful, be kind, give thanks, have courage and encourage others. Do as much good as you can for as long as you can and always be the light. Amen. Mm -hmm.